It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. We've talked a lot about inflation and how expensive so many things have become. But I want to talk about the opposite. At the same time, this is a real irony that we're facing inflation on some things, There are a lot, a lot of deals and clearance sales going on other places. And one of the places you can get bargains right now, okay, I have not lost my mind, don't have a fever, it's Amazon. I'm going to tell you about that. And speaking of saving, how do some people do it? How do they, on a less than average salary, let's say, how did they manage to become financially independent? How did they get the savings done? We're going to talk about that later. So great, great ironic time that there are deals on different things while other things are like the price is going crazy. Amazon is having a relatively difficult time right now. If it weren't for AWS, Amazon World Services, where they make all their money, I don't know what they do with their whole retail operation. Amazon has a bunch of warehouses they're closing, a bunch of sites they're abandoning in Uh, mid-construction. They're having a rough, rough time because they... Uh, sometimes you can live too much by your analytics. And when Amazon sales and others, by the way, went crazy during the pandemic where people wanted everything delivered that they might have gone to a store before for, there was a belief in the what you'd read in the business press and what companies thought internally, like Amazon, that this was forever, that once people started doing all this online shopping, they would keep doing it. Well, it didn't work out that way. And it turns out that a lot of people actually enjoy going to physical stores. Plus, Amazon's in a bit of a bind where they spent uh, two decades building up market share at the cost of making money. In other words, not making money. And now they're like, wait, wait, wait. We've got all these customers now. Now we've got to make money on them. They push prices up so much that it's pushed customers away. So Amazon is in a big overstock mode right now. And they're using a discount site they bought years ago and still use that brand name, Woot, W-O-O-T dot com, with constant clearance sales on stuff that had been on Amazon. What's really interesting is Woot's original business model was they had a single item a day. The Woot company, the people who owned it, the buyers, they only had to come up with 365 items in a year, except in leap year, they had to come up with 366. Now you go on Woot, and in a single day, they may have more than those number of items for sale. And so Amazon is using Woot as a way to move product, often new items that are in vast overstock in Amazon's orbit. If you're an Amazon Prime member, you get free shipping on the Woot items, but they don't do two-day guaranteed delivery. But you do get the items free of shipping. Also, Amazon has been doing something at Woot where on certain items, the Amazon Prime members get a lower price than other people. And then there's Amazon Warehouse. And I don't know if you're familiar with Amazon Warehouse. They don't even make it easy to find. But if you go to Amazon.com and you look at the top, if you're an Amazonian, you're familiar with this, and you at Amazon in the search bar, you've got an All button. Well, if you click on All, One of the categories is Amazon Warehouse right near the top, and you click on it, and you see everything available on Amazon Warehouse. A big chunk of the merchandise 
or items that people bought on Amazon and returned, may have been nothing wrong with them, they just returned them and they're being sold open box at a lower price through Amazon Warehouse than they're being sold otherwise. And then they have things that are used or things that people returned after they had them for a while, but they still had a right to return them. And so the condition of the items will vary and the merchandise is very heavily tilted towards electronics, but it's not just electronics. They've got a baby goods section for people who like going camping and doing outdoor stuff. They have that. Uh, they have a grocery section. So there's a lot of different categories, automotive and, of course, pets. I mean, you look at what people spend money on now. They're pets. Pet motels you can take here. Pet resort. I mean, it's crazy what people spend on pets. So at least getting pet stuff at discounts is a great thing. And and Krista, I did kind of take a glance at you when I started talking <laughs> about the pets and you started laughing. Well, my dogs are at daycare right now. so. And it is true that raising your dogs from zero up is more expensive than raising your humans in your I, household from I wouldn't zero say to that. 18, we, right? We like to do it big with all of them in our house, I guess. So, no, but yeah, they go to, they go to daycare uh, one or two days a week. Well, Krista uh, is very fashionable and is also very careful with what you spend on clothing. Mm -hmm. And so I've been asked um, an amazing number of times why we never talk about what Americans call sheen but I think the proper way to pronounce this is Xi'an. And they are booming in the United States. And they look like they're on their way to being the potentially the largest seller of clothing in the United States. It's S-H-E-I-N. Yeah. And they're opening pop-up stores in the U.S. And they've been doing a, a big expansion of warehouses in the U.S. And my son and I got into a funny discussion because I spend so little on my clothing. And Grant was asking me how I felt about Shein. And I said, well, you know, I've looked at it and it's too expensive for me. And he started laughing because I spend so little money on my clothing that Shein, which is considered to be the cheapest place for people to shop by anybody who's into any sense of fashion at all, that uh, to me, the prices were expensive. But he tells me, and you tell me, that the prices there are really, really cheap. Yeah, it's definitely fast fashion. So um, it's like an H&M or Zara kind of yeah, idea. Yeah, but even like, yeah, even cheaper, I think. Um, and so my friend was actually just complaining that her daughter, she got a bill, her daughter had spent $70 there on clothes and she was really upset and I was like she must have got an entire wardrobe for $70. So they're controversial because there are people who say that they mistreat their factory workers and uh, so there's a lot of questions about whether this Chinese company is really abusing its workers or not but they are a real player in the market and uh, so the answer is no, I've never ordered anything from Shein because they're out of my price range. Uh, they are supposedly very inexpensive. And no, I can't verify whether or not they mistreat their workers. So there you have it. Now I've talked about Shein. And so I looked at ordering a couple of things from them because it's just people keep asking me about it and what the experience is like. And I couldn't do it because the things were just too expensive for me. Because, you know, if an item is more than single digit in price, it really is out of my budget. I saw dresses for $10 on there. It's crazy. You know, I don't look good in dresses. Well, you know, I'll take so one for I'm the team and order dresses. one if you want. Okay. Will in Oklahoma says, I need more tax savings. I'm a W-2 wage earner and I max out my 401k. My wife has a W-2J job where she maxes out her 401k as well. In addition, she started picking up some relief work that pays really well, but I would like to invest as much of this in a tax-deferred retirement plan as possible. The goal is to reduce our current AGI to reduce income-based repayment amounts for her federal student loans. I looked into self-employed 401ks, but 
what that looks like her contributions would be reduced by her W-2 contributions, and there would be no effective tax benefits of setting up a self-employed 401k. Are there any other plans that we could contribute money to in order to reduce our AGI? All right. So, Will, as I understand what you're asking, the side income that your wife has is 1099. She's being paid like an independent contractor. So there is a vehicle for her that would reduce AGI, have the current tax benefit you're looking for, and that would be doing a uh, SEP, a Simplified Employee Pension, or known as a SEP-IRA. Uh, they The paperwork for it takes about, I don't know, 45 seconds, a minute to fill out. There's like nothing to it. And then you open it, you can open a SEP with any of the low-cost companies like uh, Vanguard, Schwab, Fidelity, anybody like that. You can open a SEP. The amounts you can contribute to one uh, are quite large. And if you go to Investopedia and you look at their explanation of a SEP, you'll have it. We have a very brief one on Clark.com, but I think in this case, go read the Investopedia briefing on SEPs, and that would be a potential way to reduce that AGI and then have a direct impact on the amount of money she saved for retirement and also reduce income basis for the um, income-based repayment program. This is from Chris in California. Hi, Clark. My doctor recently sent me a pamphlet and letter stating they were going to a concierge model of service and therefore not taking insurance for most things. I see that they will have an annual membership fee as well as monthly fees. The thing that I was surprised to see was that they're going from a for-profit corporation to a non-profit tax-exempt corporation in conjunction with a health foundation. While I understand some of the reasons to have a concierge practice, how does their nonprofit status figure into their motivation for changing the way the practice does business? Okay, so we had a question about this recently as well from someone about their doctor going through a transition. And people are using different terminology for it. The most common terminology for it is? Uh, primary... Direct primary care. Yes, direct, direct primary, primary care. care. And so uh, when I first did a, a story about this on television, it was like seven or eight years ago about direct primary care. And the idea is so much of a doctor's office overhead is dealing with all the terrible insurance company rules and restrictions and trying to get approvals for this, that, and the other. And doctors have learned that they can dramatically reduce the cost of running their practice if they go to a version of what often is coined direct primary care. In the event of a nonprofit, their goal is to provide care to people as cheaply as possible. So by going to a model where insurance isn't involved and you pay them a fee, this is different than concierge medicine. Concierge medicine tends to have an annual fee of roughly $2,000 to $12,000 a year. The difference from the $2,000 to $12,000 is how many patients a doctor is allowed to bring into his or her practice and how accessible that doctor is to you. In direct primary care, it's more about uh, giving lower cost care to people or being able to provide care at a lower cost by cutting insurance companies out of it for routine care. It does, though, still mean you need an insurance policy for hospitalization because even though you're getting your primary care for a lower flat rate, it still doesn't deal in most cases with what happens if you need an expensive surgery or there's a hospitalization or whatever. But the insurance companies are harming the cost of medical care in the United States, without doubt, because of the layer after layer after layer after layer of bureaucracy that's involved, and that you have people that are just trying to, to limit what an insurer has to pay and wasting a doctor's time when he or she is having to explain to some person in an insurance company who's not a medically trained person 
why a particular procedure or test or whatever is medically necessary, and it's all about wearing the doctors down and building in all this extra layer of cost. So that's how this came about. It gives doctors autonomy and independence again and lowers the cost of running their practice. And from Jay in Texas, my wife subscribes to a lot of magazines via the mail. Editorial comment, way too many. (laughs) In recent months, a couple of the publishers have begun sending related books unsolicited, recipes, decorating tips, etc. The letter that accompanies the books gives the impression that they're free, yet an invoice is enclosed. Question, she has no interest in them. Is she under any obligation to mail them back? Okay, so this is a little complicated, Jay. When your wife subscribed to magazines, just as in retail stores when they say, would you like a free magazine for blah, blah, blah time? And you say yes, and then they, they charge you to your credit card for those magazines that supposedly were free. It's all in the disclosure it's not at all unusual. The magazine industry is so desperate for revenue right now that with a renewal in all the lingo that comes with it, there may have been something that says you agree to receive so many cookbooks or this or that or the other over the course of your subscription. And if you wish to keep them, you'll pay us. If you don't, you have to send them back. And that's often in the disclosure It's all the legalese for the magazines. On the other hand, if your wife did not enter into any of those agreements, and these came by U.S. mail, unsolicited items that you receive only by U.S. mail, not from UPS or FedEx, are yours to keep with no obligation to pay if there's not some prior agreement that allows them to be sent. So that's why the answer to this is fuzzy because your wife unknowingly in her subscription or in a renewal of a subscription may have agreed to receive periodically these um, these books in the mail and is required if she doesn't want them if she did enter in an agreement to have the expense of sending them back magazine business is truly in a desperation survival mode and sometimes unsavory practices creep in when an industry is trying to survive so i want to talk about something thriving not surviving that's coming up is how do you regardless of what you make within reason past a minimally subsistent salary How do you build that financial independence? We're going to talk about that. From a very young age, I was obsessed with saving money. And if you've listened to me for a long time, you already know that from right out of college, I resolved that I was going to live on every other paycheck. Going through college, I'd lived a very bare bones existence. I lived on whatever food I could scrounge up a deal on. I was very, 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 very thrifty. And so in college, I had to get used to living on very little money. I even had a semester I couldn't buy my textbooks, so I didn't have the money. I made it through that semester somehow. And so when you first get a job out of whatever schooling you do, you're used to getting by on such a little amount of money, and then suddenly you get this paycheck from, let's say, your first real job. And suddenly, what's known as the marginal propensity to consume, it's an economic principle that means as our income goes up, magically, somehow, our spending goes right up with it. The key habit you'll see of people who are into FI, financial independence, also known as mega savers or super savers or various terms like that are used. There are certain things that are generally consistent. 
And it's a mentality. In my case, it was living on every other paycheck. Today, what's very common is people who come out of school of whatever level become instant savers for retirement. Roth IRAs. I mean, it's fascinating to me how many people I hear from that are plus or minus 20 a couple of years are familiar with Roth IRAs and asking about them and how to start one, how to fund one, what the money should be in, that kind of thing. I mean, it's in their vocabulary, it's in their head. And habits that start young make a difference. But there's other things as well about financial habits. Principal Financial Group did a survey and found that one of the things of people that are good savers, regardless of income, this is important, regardless of income, because they found that a lot of people who make around 35000 a year were doing really well saving money for the future. And you think at 35 in a lot of metro areas, how do you even pay all your bills every month? But there are a lot of people at 35000 and more who are saving substantial amount of money for retirement. What is consistent whether somebody makes 35000 or makes hundreds of thousands of dollars? They don't ever buy a new car. They buy only used cars. They drive that car, as I call it, till the wheels fall off. Think about how many people, if you're a long-time listener to me, you'll hear a quote back to me, yeah, I'm going to drive my car till the wheels fall off. And you may wonder, why do I put this big emphasis on the cars, transportation? Because that is the second biggest expense that the typical person or family has in their lives is that, that set of wheels, truck, SUV, whatever. I think about people who have pickup trucks and how many pickup trucks you see now that cost sixty to a hundred thousand dollars and there are all these fancy new pickup trucks on the road and then you see other people and you'll be at a work site and you see people with these fancy fancy king ranch f-150s and all this stuff and then you see uh, somebody at that construction site who's driving an old 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 beat up pickup truck and, you know, both of them got to the construction site that day. But one of them has a big monthly payment, and the other has been paid for forever. So another thing I, I have shared in the past, but not in a good while, that in my TV work, I used to do these things where I'd go to schools of different levels, from elementary school to college and we do a, what we call to get Clark smart or a Clark town hall depending on what the TV channel wanted to call it at that time or network and I always had this thing with two slides and it didn't matter again if these were elementary school kids or college students or anywhere in between I'd show these two slides and I'd ask which family were the millionaires? And one would be picture of a modest home, an older vehicle, and various household possessions that had some age on them. And then the other would be a big fancy new house with fancy vehicles, not vehicle, vehicles, and all these other things. And it didn't matter if they were elementary school kids, college students, in between, overwhelmingly, they would say it was the slides of the fancy family with the fancy stuff that were the millionaires. But you know, as the late um, 
Professor Stanley, who wrote The Millionaire Next Door, found out more than a generation ago that most millionaires live in a modest home. Most millionaires drive a very old, just modest vehicle. That things that they consume, they're very careful with because the key is saving money. The other thing is that most millionaires turned out to be people who owned service businesses. And people that are wealthy tend to not care about how it looked to the neighbor. The neighbor has a fancy car, so man, we look like nothing. Look at our old car. But I remember forever ago, I had an employee who was really into saving money. And she said to me, anytime we'd be out and about and we'd see a fancy car, she'd say, least. <laughs> and I loved it. Because the point was that somebody was a show horse. They were trying to show off. They weren't being careful with their money. So know that there's a mentality involved. The mentality is basically you walk softly with modesty and you're quiet about what you accomplish. But the point is to live a life of good habits with what you save and what you spend your money on, regardless of what you make past subsistence, it's how you choose those decisions that makes all the difference on whether or not you were financially dependent in your life or you're financially independent in your life. Krista? We had a couple of questions about um, being charged extra when booking travel or other things um, for using a credit card. And here's one of them. This is from Donna in Georgia. She says, we are booking a Viking cruise and can save a substantial amount of money if we use e-check instead of a credit card to pay. Is this safe? Wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. A couple of things with the cruise industry. Um, I've been reading in the financial press, regardless of cruise line, the level of indebtedness the cruise lines have from COVID. Imagine the cost of those ships. And two years, basically, those ships sitting there unloved, unused. And the amount of debt the cruise lines had to take on to survive that. So there are a couple of things. One, I always want you to pay for a cruise with a credit card, never a debit card. Remember? Remember this thought? Piece of trash Fake Visa or fake MasterCard equals debit card. Never, 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 not ever use a debit card to pay for travel. Absolutely do not use an e-check to pay for a cruise. Or travel. Or travel. Second, if you are going on a cruise or going on an expensive tour buy trip insurance that covers supplier default, never buy trip insurance, what they call insurance or trip coverage, from a cruise line itself. Because if, and there's nothing I'm saying about Viking. I'm saying with any cruise line, the cruise industry is on the ropes financially. The debt levels are astronomical. So, we don't know who's going to survive and who's not. So that's why you buy trip insurance from a third party. Traditional trip insurance policy, never from the cruise line. So pay more for that Viking cruise by paying with a credit card and don't risk the e-check. And Craig in Indiana says, my daughter got a fraud alert from a university that she recently applied to. Since she is now 18, I thought it would be a great time to freeze her credit. The credit bureaus are telling me that she has to open a line of credit to freeze it. Is that really true? What options do I have? That has to be the dumbest thing in the world. So that is the dumbest thing in the world. And Craig, they didn't tell you exactly right. 
the credit bureau has to do a uh, manual procedure internally to generate a file on her because your daughter's showing what they call thin or no. She hasn't had credit in the past, so she doesn't show as existing. Um, the fastest path to do this, though, is temporarily make her an authorized user on one of your cards where you give them her social security number and that will immediately create a credit file for her. If it's a big issuer of credit cards that you have, they probably report to all three credit bureaus. That will instantly create a credit file for her within weeks and it would then be ultra easy for her to go online and set up credit freeze with each of the bureaus. It's not the worst thing in the world for you to name her as an authorized user. Just never give her the plastic. It will help her establish a credit identity for when she does attempt to get credit on her own at some point in the future. Don in Nevada says, I have T-Mobile home internet at $50 a month. It works quite well, but Verizon is offering home internet for $25, no contract, with a modem and router included in the offer. Should I try them, stay with T-Mobile, or maybe see if T-Mobile will make me a customer retention offer to stay with them? So you're with T-Mobile for cell phone service? Uh, T-Mobile, if you're on Magenta Max, cell phone plan Magenta Max, you'll pay $30 a month, not $50 for internet from them. So right now you're paying $50. Now Verizon, as I understand it, is 50 unless you are a Verizon customer of a certain level, in which case you get the 25. Although it's possible in your local area, Verizon trying to establish some market presence is offering $25 a month for people who are not already Verizon wireless customers. But in the national TV ads Verizon's running, at the end in the crawl where they put all the legalese, it does say that the 25 that they're offering is only for people who are on certain Verizon wireless plans. I'm really glad you're happy with the T-Mobile home internet. It's working for you. You'd be happier at 30 instead of 50. So check to see what T-Mobile plan you're on to see if it's worth it for you to switch your T-Mobile wireless service or maybe you're already eligible for the 30 a month. Because, as you said, you don't want to switch from T-Mobile to Verizon. And if that Verizon offer does, in fact, require that you be their customer, then your best bet is to see if you can get the 50 down to 30 with T-Mobile. And if you are a prisoner right now of the cable monster that's the monopoly in your area or the monopoly local phone company in your area, they both charge up, up, and away huge money for monthly internet. And it's great for you to look to see if the T-Mobile home internet or the Verizon wireless version of home internet are available where you live because regardless, they're going to be cheaper than typically what's offered by the Monopoly local phone company or the cable monster. I will let you know in areas where the big players are facing competition, from the Ver Verizon Wireless Home Internet and the T-Mobile Home Internet that a lot of the incumbent monopolies are offering a $30 to $50 a month level of service with a slower data speed. And they're doing that as a defensive measure to not lose people to T-Mobile Home Internet or Verizon Wireless Home Internet. So thank goodness we're getting to an era where we're actually having some real bona fide competition, which we've never had for internet service in the United States. So I'm so thrilled that T-Mobile and Verizon Wireless are both doing this right now. And I want to thank you so much for listening today. I want you to know that you're part of our team. You're part of Team Clark. And if there's ever anything you hear me talking about that you feel like I could do a better job answering it, please take the time to let us know. If it's something you're hot under the collar about, go to clark.com slash clarkstinks. If it's just information you think we should know, just give us the opportunity to let us know 
if there's a way that I could help your fellow listener better, I need to know. Thank you so much.